This hymn that the band just sang, It Is Well With My Soul, was not written by a priest or a musician or a worship leader or really anyone involved with the church. This hymn was actually written by a real estate investor in Chicago, a very successful one. He owned a bunch of uh, property all along Lake Michigan and all the best spots. He was uh, very well known and prominent in the city of Chicago. He had four daughters. Uh, but this was not when he wrote that all was well with his soul. Almost overnight, he lost everything he had. In the Chicago fire, he lost all his real estate investments, his money, his home, everything. And in the midst of that loss, he decided to send his family on a vacation over to Europe. So his wife and four daughters went ahead of him, and he was going to follow on the next ship. And the ship carrying his family crashed and sunk on the way to Europe. And he lost all four of his daughters. And so as he was on the ship over to Europe to meet his wife, in the midst of all this grief, in, in a span of five days, he had lost almost everything that he had. And on the boat on the way over to Europe, the ship captain said, this is where it happened, this is where uh, the ship crashed, and this is where your daughters rest. And that's when a real estate investor wrote these words. Whatever my lot, God has taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And I wonder how many of us today can sing those words and truly mean it, truly mean this Sunday morning that it is well with our soul. Our soul is well when we stay closely connected with God, but so many things get in the way of that being a reality for us. We get busy, we get burnt out, we get apathetic about our faith. Few of us rarely and intentionally separate ourselves from God. It's, it's rarely a choice. It's usually something that happens without us realizing it. We get distracted, we lose focus, we get busy, and then we wake up one day and realize we haven't been to church or small group or anything in months. We don't know where our Bible is. Our prayer life's non-existent, and we've become completely disconnected from God. And it's in moments like these, when it is not well with our soul, that we really need to turn and focus on our spiritual self-care. So last week, Pastor Craig introduced our new self-care series, and we'll be going over it for the next three weeks. And I should say, Pastor Craig this weekend is taking advantage of the fact that he now has an associate pastor, and he is not here this Sunday. He is in Minnesota with his family uh, at St. Olaf doing some college stuff with Benjamin, and he'll be back next week. Um, if you're new with us this morning, so am I. Uh, so we can be new together. My name's Leandra. I'm the new associate pastor as of last Sunday. And as the associate, <laughs> so as the associate pastor, I'm going to follow in the senior pastor's footsteps, and I'm going to use the same chart that he used last Sunday. If you were here, you saw this. Um, this is going to be kind of the chart we're going to use for this self-care series. Craig uses it a lot in his counseling. He drew it last week. Um, but these are kind of the four weeks we're going to go over for self-care. Last week, Craig did physical. This week, we're going to talk about spiritual. Then we have emotional and relational as well. And this chart is kind of a self-inventory of where you're at, maybe which one you want to focus on for the month or what areas uh, may be keeping you from, from living your best life. So how this chart works is it goes from 1 to 10, and you kind of rank how you're doing in each of the four categories. So let's say you've come in here today, and it is not well with your soul at all, you're way down here. And because it's not well with your soul, you're probably not doing too well emotionally. Let's say physically a little bit better, and then relationally also not doing so great. So this is where you would fill out the chart if that was your situation, and then you connect those four points of where you're at. And that circle represents the size of your life right now. So the goal of this self-care series and of self-care in general is to try and make our lives bigger and more full so that we can live abundantly the way God wants us to. So spiritual well-being kind of affects these other three in a big way. If, if we can raise our spiritual well-being, our spiritual health, even just up a few points, that's probably going to help our emotional life, right? We're going to be less anxious, less depressed, uh, less worried, we're probably going to go up a little bit. And if those two things are growing, our relationships are probably going to be in better shape because if we're in better shape, our relationships can be in better shape. So that's going to go up. 
And let's say physical, you stay around the same. So now, in this new chart, just by increasing your spiritual life, you've increased your entire life. Because our spiritual health is going to affect those other three nine times out of ten. So why I think spiritual affects those other ones is it's a little different than the other ones, right? Our, our physical, relational, and emotional well-being, those kind of affect how we are, how we're doing, how we're feeling. But our spiritual well-being affects who we are, right? Physical is our body, relational, emotional, those kind of affect our mind, but our spiritual health is really connected to our heart. And our heart becomes our words and actions and who we are. So if our spiritual well-being is down, we're not going to be living as the people we're meant to be living. And the better we get spiritually, uh, the closer we can be to living as who God intended us to be. So in order to be the people God intended us to be, we need to stay closely connected to God. And... Are you guys familiar with the telephone game that you play as kids where like someone starts here and whispers something in the next person's ear and it goes down the chain and then you get to the end and see if it's the same thing and it never is? So that's kind of how our spiritual self-care can be. If we start over here with who God wants us to be and who God tells us we are, you know, God is telling us you are loved, you have purpose, you're worthy, uh, you are good. You're all these things that God tells you. But then as our life carries on, uh, this message gets distorted by each chain. You know, we go to school. Someone at school says something about us. We go to work. A coworker mentions something about our performance. Uh, we go home and a relative makes a comment at Thanksgiving dinner that gets to us. And we go here and one of our friends gets upset with us or, you know, we had this dream and we failed and it fell apart. And so now we get to the end of the chain and what God says about us and what God knows about us, we're not hearing that anymore. We're hearing it through all these other things and all these other people. So now instead of hearing that we're loved and have purpose and all these things, we're hearing you're not worthy to be loved. You had a purpose and you failed. You're not good enough. Uh, you're hearing all these messed up messages. And our sp a strong spiritual self-care in these practices can really help keep you over here because all these messages are just going to be a part of life. We can't get rid of those. But when we're really spiritually healthy, uh, we deal with them better and we keep that message of who God says we are and who we're supposed to be closer in our minds than these other messages. So for our scripture this morning, we're going to look at one of the most spiritually healthy churches in the history of the church. All the people in there, it was very well with their souls. Things were going great. The church was growing. They were serving the whole community. Everyone knew about them. They were all in great spirits. And this is the very first church in Acts, a super spiritually healthy church with spiritually healthy people. So we're going to look at a little bit of how they functioned and how they stayed so spiritually well. The church is described in Acts 2. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So in this spiritually healthy and growing church, I see four main things that they're doing over and over again to help stay healthy. They're studying scripture. They have really strong prayer lives. They're constantly in fellowship. And they're also constantly breaking the bread or practicing the sacrament of communion. And I think most of us would agree that these four things can help make us more spiritually healthy. But I also think that most of us don't know how to make any of these things a regular part of our life. Maybe we start a practice or we try like, okay, I am going to pray every morning the rest of this week. And after two days, it kind of fizzles out or we forget or we don't have time. So if you look in your bulletin, one of the many inserts is this bigger one. If you want to pull this out, we've kind of created a menu on here of different spiritual practices that you could take on for the next 21 days which means if you start one today, it'll go exactly to the end of the month in June. So maybe you pick one that really speaks to you or you think will work for you. 
uh, and then you do it for the month of June, and then in July you want to try another one or continue it or try something else. So I would recommend, as you read through this, maybe just picking one to commit to, because if you try and do too many, like I said, will fizzle out. So the first two are the, uh, the first two things you see the church doing in Acts are studying scripture and prayer. And these are kind of the two most common things when we think of spiritual health. We're always like, I should read my Bible more and I should pray. That's what we see Jesus doing all the time. That's what we hear about in church and youth group and all those other things all the time. Those are kind of the most common ones. So I'm going to start with scripture. And there are tons of reasons and tons of ways to read the Bible. And we all kind of do it in our own way. But I think there are two main outcomes when we think about reading scripture two main things that we get out of like having this spiritual practice. One is we learn about God, and two is we learn about ourselves. God is obviously the main character in this story. This book was written to teach people who God is and what God does and what it means for us. But all the rest of the characters are us, how we relate to God, how we're affected by God, what happens when things go wrong, what happens when things go right. So as you stay engaged in this, you learn a lot about who God is, and a lot about who you are as well. And just like that telephone metaphor I was talking about earlier, if, if we start over here with who God is, and we're getting that message from Scripture, the more we stay in Scripture, you know, if someone says something at work, but then we're in Scripture. Some, someone says something when we're at home, but we stay in Scripture. By the time we get to the end, we're still going to be closer to who God says we were because we're staying in, involved in Scripture, who's, which is constantly reminding us of who we are. Because scripture offers a different true message of who we are than the rest of the world. And staying engaged in that can really help you keep track of who you are and stay spiritually healthy. So the most common difficulty I hear when someone wants to read the Bible more or pray more is, I don't know what to read, I don't know how to pray. And that's what this insert is intended to help you go over. We've listed, uh, for, the, for scripture we have two different 21 day reading plans you can choose from. If you're trying to just get kick-started, you don't know. I want to get more involved in the Bible. I don't know where to start. So the first one is an Old Testament and New Testament one. It's going to take you through the whole book of Luke in 21 days. And it's also going to take you through some highlights of the Old Testament. Because I think when we try and start reading scripture, we tend to stay in the New Testament. It's, it's a lot more comfortable, easier to understand. Jesus is there to help us. It's just easier to read the New Testament. But the Bible is about 80% Old Testament. And so if we just completely skip that part, we're missing a huge chunk of what's going on in Scripture. And the Old Testament is obviously a lot more confusing. There's a lot more going on. I just went to school for three years to learn about it, and I still sometimes have no idea what's going on in there. But when we, when we just read the New Testament, we're missing out on most of the story. So this plan is intended to kind of balance that out and keep you engaged. And if you go through this plan, it'll really help you uh, focus on that first uh, purpose of Scripture, which is to learn about God. This plan is really going to teach you about God and what God does and who God is. The second reading plan I stole from a pastor you might know named Billy Graham. He would read five psalms and one proverb every morning before he did anything. This reading plan on here starts you with one in one because... Let's just start easy. You can work your way up to five. But he said that he does this reading plan because the Psalms teach him how to relate to God and the Proverbs teach him how to relate to people. So he would start every morning with how do I relate to God, how do I relate to people, and then he would go about his day living by those guidelines. So this second reading plan on there really kind of accomplishes that second purpose of learning about yourself. If you want to learn more about who you are and who God is in relation to you, this second plan uh, can really help you with that. Now, the second thing the church in Acts was doing was constantly, constantly praying. If you read through Acts, almost everything they do starts and ends with prayer. And if anything good happens, it's attributed to prayer. It's, it's throughout the whole book. And I think prayer is a little bit more tricky to teach or to start a practice of because it is going to be different for every single person in here. There's no prayer practice I can write on here and be like, okay, everyone in the church, go pray like this and it'll work for everyone. Because prayer is a conversation. It's communication within a relationship, so it's going to be personalized. You know, the way that I would talk to Sam is not the same way that I would talk to my mom. 
And the same way you would talk to your friends isn't the same way you talk to your coworkers usually because the way we communicate is based on the relationship. And prayer is the same way. The person sitting next to you has a different relationship with God than you do. And they're going to communicate with God in a different way than you do. So your prayer practice practices are going to look completely different most of the time. But the one thing that's true for all of us is that none of our spiritual lives are going to flourish or grow or improve if we have no communication with God whatsoever. So whatever that prayer practice is personally for you, uh, just make sure that it's a regular part of your life. Whether it's journaling, meditation, music, something completely different, whatever works for you. So the two prayer practices that we have on here are just kind of ideas to help get you started if prayer has really been a struggle for you. Or like I said, you just don't know what to do. Uh, The first one, the easiest way to learn how to pray is doing exactly what Jesus taught us, which is the Lord's Prayer. When the disciples asked, how do we pray, this was Jesus' answer, and it's still his answer. But I think with the Lord's Prayer, we say it every Sunday, and we've heard it so many times that it starts to just mean nothing. It's just a poem that we recite. Um, So like every Sunday we say, our Father who art in heaven, you know, it's just like, We've said it so many times, we don't even know what the words are and what they mean anymore. And most of the time, we're not even really praying it as much as we're just reciting it. So on this insert here, the guided Lord's Prayer at the bottom, this is kind of intended to reintroduce you to the Lord's Prayer and what it really means to pray the Lord's Prayer. So underneath each line of that is kind of a guided uh, suggestion of here's what Jesus is telling you to pray about in this section of the prayer. And so you can go through it in kind of a more personalized way and break it up and be like, give us this day our daily bread. Pause. What is your daily bread today? Actually pray for those things. Uh, Think about what you're praying. That one can kind of help keep us on track. The second prayer practice, and I think this will probably relate to most people, but have you ever had that experience where you start praying, you get like 10 seconds in, And then you're just thinking about your to-do list and did you move the laundry and where do you have to go after this and what time is it. And after about like three minutes of getting worked up, you realize like, oh, yeah, I'm praying, I'm praying. Uh, Dear God. And I can only make it like 10 seconds before I'm thinking about who knows what. So this is kind of a prayer practice for those people who get distracted very easily to kind of keep you on track. And it's a musical prayer practice. So I put some suggested songs on there. If you have a favorite or anything you like, go with that. But instead of, you know, praying and thinking in your head, you kind of pray along with the music. So I'll put a song on in the morning, and as it plays, I'll just pray the words to that song and follow the song, because then I can focus on that instead of getting distracted by all the things on my to-do list. So if you tend to get distracted in prayer, that may be uh, a good option for you as well. So... The third thing I'm going to spend a little more time on, but the third thing that the church in Acts is always, always doing is being in fellowship. And fellowship does not mean just hanging out. Like if you come into church in the morning and you sit and you, you know, watch the service, whatever, you can't go home and be like, oh, I was in fellowship with like the 80 people that were there today. Fellowship is a little bit more than that. Fellowship is actually having a meaningful community, like engaging in conversation, spending time with those people, getting to know each other, uh, having conversation about real things beyond just the Sunday morning small talk, how are you, I'm good. So fellowship is something that was really important to that first church, and it's going to be really important to our spiritual lives as well. Now, the opposite of fellowship is independence, self-reliance, self-sufficiency, doing everything on your own, you know, kind of that pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. I don't need anyone else. I'm going to do it on my own. But have any of you actually ever tried to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps? Or have any of you guys ever worn bootstraps? Um, Probably not. But back when people did wear bootstraps in like the 1930s is when this phrase came about. And it didn't mean, good job, you did it all by yourself. It actually meant to try to do something that's completely absurd and impossible. But our culture loves the idea of being independent and self-sufficient and not needing anybody that we've turned it into a good phrase. You know, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps is a good thing. But really, it's to do something that's impossible. And trying to live independently of other people and trying to grow your spiritual health 
all by yourself without other people helping you is completely absurd and impossible. It truly is trying to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And self-reliance, this idea of self-reliance is nothing that Jesus taught us or even really encouraged. That's more of an American value because Jesus actually taught the opposite. He taught reliance in everything. In everything you do, reliance on God. In everything you do, reliance on other people. I mean, even Jesus, who was God and probably could have done everything by himself if he wanted, still let 12 other people follow him around everywhere he went and did everything with these 12 other people because he knew how important the idea of fellowship was. Even though if we read through the gospel, we see that the disciples are constantly annoying Jesus. He gets mad at them, frustrated. They fight a lot. Probably sounds like a lot of our fellowships. Jesus still thought that it was worth it to bring these 12 guys around with him because he also knew the benefits of fellowship, that they could be there for each other. They could rely on each other. They could have those really intimate conversations like, how should we pray? Fellowship wasn't always easy, but it was worthwhile. In an individualistic culture like ours, we don't really value the idea of fellowship. It's better to be on your own. I mean, if you are self-reliant, that's like the ultimate sign of success. I don't need anyone else. I'm completely self-reliant. I did it. I'm successful. Those things are usually thought of as good. But when we also look in Scripture, we see that this idea of self-reliance and being independent is the very first thing that God ever calls not good. So think back to the creation story. In the beginning, God created the earth and the land and the sea and the sky and light and dark. And they stepped back and looked at everything and saw that it was good. Then he created the plants, the animals, everything that walks on earth. He stepped back and he saw that all of that was good. He created human beings. They populated the earth. And God looked at humans and saw that they were And all of creation, God looked at and saw that it was very, very good. And then God saw one not good thing. God says, it is not good for the people to be alone. Even when the world was perfect, it was still not good for us to be alone. The bad news is, the world is not perfect anymore. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but it's gotten pretty bad since then. And it is even harder for us to do things alone. That not good that God originally saw has gotten even harder, completely absurd and impossible for us. We simply cannot do it alone, and we definitely will not grow spiritually if we're trying to do it on our own. If you just take one of these reading and prayer practices and you just do it by yourself, you may benefit. But if no other people are involved, it's just not going to last. And it's not going to spread and infect the rest of your life. So those first three practices, uh, reading scripture, prayer, and fellowship, those are all things you kind of have to put into your schedule, right? You have to schedule time to read and pray. You have to schedule time to make it to small group during the week or to make it to church on Sunday or to schedule that phone call with someone even though you're really busy or send an email. All these things uh, are things we have to schedule into our life. But God didn't want to be limited to just our church activities. God didn't want to just be uh, something that we interact with on Sunday morning or at small group and then is completely not involved in anything else we're doing away from here. God did not want to have a 30-minute session with you in the morning and then you leave and God's completely not involved with anything else you do the rest of the day. God wanted to be a part of all of that. Yes, we can start with reading or prayer or whatever in the morning, but that's not where God ends. When this service ends... It's not the end of our Jesus time or the spiritual time for the morning. God wanted to be a part of our whole life, part of our every day. And when Jesus came to earth, he kind of modeled this. He didn't come to earth and hang out in church the whole time. He wasn't just leading Bible studies in small groups and going on mission trips. He went to weddings and funerals. He went to eat with people in their homes. He went fishing with people. He would show up at people's jobs unannounced and usually unwanted and want to see what was going on at the tax collector's office. Jesus wanted to be a part of people's everyday lives. He wanted to be in their homes, where they worked, at school, where they hung out on the weekends. But I think in many ways we've kind of pushed Jesus just back into the church. 
this is our Jesus time. This is where Jesus is. We'll talk about him and learn about him here, but, like, we're not going to go do anything else outside. That would be crazy. But our spiritual well-being is so dependent on being closely connected with God that one hour on Sunday or even 30 minutes every morning just isn't going to be enough to sustain it if we're not inviting Jesus to be a part of all the other times in our life as well. So I want to invite you to choose one of these spiritual practices, but throughout the next week or the rest of the month, I also want to invite you to do something else. I want to invite you to look for how Jesus is present in your everyday life, even when it's not a specifically church or spiritual activity. Look for how God is working at home, at work, in your family, in your busy schedule, in your downtime. Be aware of how God is reaching out to you through other people that you might not expect God to communicate through, through your everyday schedule, through the random activities you have to do. Be aware of the everyday blessings, opportunities, and moments of grace that are happening all the time away from this building. And Jesus knew that we would kind of push him back into the church. So... The last spiritual, the last activity that the church in Acts was doing is one that Jesus started so that he could be a part of our everyday life. Jesus chose sharing a meal, something we all do, usually three times a day, sometimes four. He chose sharing a meal. We do it in our homes, with our friends and family, at work, on the weekends. And he made that a reminder of God's presence with us always. Just like we wouldn't go a day without eating, We shouldn't go a day without connecting with God. We shouldn't go a day without realizing how God is present in our lives. So the night before he was arrested, he sat down with his 12 close friends and he shared a meal with them. He chose the most ordinary, commonplace thing we do to be a symbol of his presence with us all the time. You don't need any training, you don't need to go to school, you don't need to know anything about the Bible, even if it's your first time back in church. None of that matters when it came to this last important practice of just sharing a meal with Jesus and with each other. Jesus knew he had 24 hours left to live, and he knew he only had 24 hours left with his disciples. And he did not take them to church. He did not take them to a Bible study. He did not sit in a prayer circle. He sat down at a meal. And at that meal, he took the bread. He broke it, blessed it, gave thanks, and said to his disciples, take and eat this. And every time you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Remember I am with you when it is well, when it is not well, when you're in church, when you're at home, at school, at work. Remember I'm with you when you're busy, when things are calm. Whenever you do this, remember me. And after dinner, Jesus then took the cup, blessed it and gave thanks and said, this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for all and for the forgiveness of sins. And this blood means that our sin, other people's sin, All the evil in the world that keeps us disconnected from God no longer has a hold over our soul. Even when things are bad, even in the midst of this sinful world, in the midst of everything going on, we can still say it is well with my soul because of what Jesus did on the cross. He chose this simple meal that requires nothing else but a desire to want to come and eat as his last final message to the people that he would be with them always no matter what was going on in their lives. So would you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you for being a God that desires to have a relationship with us and be connected to us, that wants to be a part of our whole life. We thank you for all the blessings we experience and all the times we could truly say it is well with my soul. We thank you for all the people in our lives that help us stay connected with you We thank you for all the opportunities that have helped us grow spiritually, as well as the setbacks that have helped made us stronger. We confess we have not always lived as closely to you as we should. We slip away, we forget. We leave you in the church and out of our lives. 
We haven't always lived as the people you intended us to be. We've let other words and messages define who we are instead of listening to you. We let our busyness get in the way of spending time with you and choose other priorities over you. So today we're thankful for your forgiveness and for what you did on the cross. That even when we become disconnected from you, you never become disconnected from us. We're thankful that our sins and shortcomings no longer keep us from you. And today I want to pray for anyone in here who may be feeling disconnected from God, who may be saying it is not well with my soul. I pray that as we come forward, they may experience your love, forgiveness, and grace. I want to lift up all the other unspoken prayers on everyone's hearts in this room, that as we pray together, we can remember those unspoken prayers as well. We join together, praying the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At the water's edge, we have what's called an open table for communion, which means everyone in here is invited to come up to the table. There's no requirement class. It doesn't have to be your fifth Sunday here. Uh, you don't have to know anything about the Bible. Everyone's invited to come up and share a meal with Jesus today. How communion works at this church is our ushers are going to come forward and dismiss you row by row. You're going to exit to your left, come up, you'll receive a piece of bread, you'll dip it in the cup, and you'll return to your seat. If you need a gluten-free bread today, we have some in this middle line, so if you're needing gluten-free, uh, you can come through my row here in the middle. And lastly, as we prepare uh, for communion, as you're sitting in your seat, I want you to think of all the ways that God has been present in your life before you came into church today. And as you receive communion and head back to your seat, I also want you to be thinking about and be aware of this is not the last time that you will commune with Jesus today. Jesus is going to be present when we go home and go to work and go to school and every other time of our life as well. So now, come and eat.